Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the podcast. If you are watching this live, if you look behind me, all the bookshelves, slowly but surely, I am getting new books for the bookshelf. I'm trying to fill them up. A lot more shelves than I thought, uh, but I want to welcome everybody back to the podcast. My name is John Abbas. I am an entrepreneur, an investor, and of course, the host of the Mentor Nation podcast. If this is your first time here, uh, I just want to welcome you. And just ask that you hit that subscribe button so that you get a notification every time I release a new episode, which is typically every single week. If you are returning, I want to thank you truly for your attention and support. And I'm excited for you to hear today's guest. Um, Today, I have the privilege of interviewing just an incredible human being that goes by the name Elon Devon. And Elon had just finished serving in the Israeli army when one day he was out having lunch with his girlfriend. And moments later, they heard an explosion right near them, and then another, and then another. And what happened is a triple suicide bombing happened right in front of them, killing a lot of people and injuring hundreds. This tragic, and life-altering experience set Elon down a path of just discovering the important questions that very few of us ever ask until we have an experience ourselves that just smack us in the face with our own morality. You know, things like how to find your life's purpose, how to hit your true potential, and most importantly, how to live a truly fulfilling life are the things that Elon discovered and systemized for other people. Today, he's the founder of Devon Academy, which helps people around the world master three very crucial topics that are the greatest predictors of success in life, mindset, emotional intelligence, and stress management. We talk about his story, his work, and he shares his best wisdom for truly living a fulfilling life. You're going to love this episode. So please help me welcome Elon Devon. All right, Elon, welcome to the podcast. Uh, Man, I'm excited to have you on today and uh, to share some of your incredible wisdom with the audience. Look, been looking forward to this for a while. Me too. Me too. Thanks for having me, John. And um, yeah, haven't been to Nashville yet, but it's on the bucket list. You should come. Well, make sure you look me up when you come because there's a lot of really, really great places here. Uh, man, I, I tell you, you have one of the most incredible stories I've ever read about, and I can't wait to get uh-huh. into that. Uh, you're an expert, obviously, on a number of topics. Um, but when I was researching you, the one that that resonated with me the most and the one that I felt would have such an impact on the listeners mm. is a topic that you call the initiation. And from what I've gathered listening to you on other interviews and your website, it's a process where you help people find their purpose. You teach the driving force behind change in human beings. And to take it a step further, you actually, you know, you teach the specific actions needed to get to that change, as well as the four thresholds uh, that you must cross in order to, and this was my favorite part, to break through to your highest and most powerful self. And I just personally can't think of a more valuable topic to understand than a process for not only finding your purpose, but also Mm -hmm. being able to operate at your highest level. And so I'm not sure if we can cover it all in this interview. I'm sure as heck going to try. But first, before we even get into that, I just think it's important for everyone to understand your story. Uh, You've seen and experienced some things that few few people ever will. And I think that gives you a unique perspective. And I was just wondering if you could share a little bit about your background. Sure. With pleasure. Um, So, yeah, I kind of had a a unique, interesting upbringing. I mean, I grew up all over the world. My father was a diplomat, so I ended up growing up between... Israel and India and Sri Lanka and Ethiopia, like four, oh, wow. four continents growing up. And so that really gave me a perspective on life and the world. And then when I was, you know, in my late teens, I was 19, 20 years old. This was uh, going back now. It's uh, um, 19, what was it, 1997. I was uh, home from 
from you know active duty in in in, in the army and had an experience that literally was a transformational moment for me. I was on a date mm-hmm. and, um, you know, hadn't, uh, was really excited about this date and we were going for lunch and we sit down at this open promenade kind of, uh, cafe, you know, underneath some canopies and we're about to order lunch. And my date, her name was Ayelet. She turns to me and it was about three o'clock in the afternoon, beautiful day. Yeah. Sun is shining like 24, 25 degrees. And she turns to me and she's like, you know, Elon, do you mind grabbing ice cream? You know, it's late. I don't really feel like having lunch. I had, I had a bite before. So I said, sure. So we get up, you know, kind of excuse ourselves. They started the waiters, walk down the street, about 50 yards down the same street, turn left onto one of the side streets. And there's this ice cream place she was talking about. And we're sitting outside again underneath this on a you know patio, street patio. And I just remember it was a beautiful day. You know, street performers were playing, you know, moms were pushing strollers and and kids were walking with their little backpacks coming home from school. And uh, we're flirting with each other. And next thing you know, there's this like clop of thunder and it comes from kind of from right up the road from where we just walked. Now, blue skies, there's no thunder now. So we're looking at each other and before our mouths could sort of find words, there's a second boom followed by a third much closer. And the third one was literally like 10, 15 yards from where we're sitting. The only thing separating us from this boom is the corner of the coffee shop where we're sitting. And in that instant, this, you know, shrapnel and debris and smoke and just stuff is, you know, flung into the air. The sky is covered with, you know, you can't see the sky anymore. It's all gray. And there's a moment of eerie silence and then just people running and screaming in terror. So we're running in the opposite direction. I realized this is obviously something really bad. Uh, And we managed to hide ourselves in this alleyway and waited out until the bomb squads and and the police and so forth arrive. And I drop my data at home, you know, uh, kind of driving in silence, just kind of digesting what happened. We knew we were just, you know, we were very close to, 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 to being in, in, maybe you know being dead um and didn't really know what happened this is before the cell phone era you know before cell phones and before news was traveling so fast so we're just processing stuff she goes home i go to home to my parents and i open the nightly news and it turns out this was a triple suicide bombing and you know up to around 180 200 people were injured many severely and three people were or five people rather were killed uh tragically two of those five at the very restaurant very table very patio where we sat for lunch moments before going for ice cream wow so that was you know that was a wake-up call for me and you know had a lot of emotions but the one thing that stuck or, or really stuck with me was you know i said to myself elon if you're alive there's got to be a purpose. I wanted to believe that there was some purpose to my life and I was intent on finding that purpose. So when I, you know, finished the army, went on my own, I I just was was keen on finding a sense of purpose. And I thought I'd be a diplomat. Like my father realized that was not my calling. Uh, I was working in, in, in an embassy and I realized I have this passion for spirituality and ancient wisdom and archaeology, anthropology. Um, long story short, I did it, how to be in political science and, um, thought I'd leave all this stuff I was passionate about for a later time when I had financial yeah. security, but this sense of purpose still kept nagging at me really truly. And it, and it got me to later a year later, a few years later, leave a job. I was working in New York city, had a great job, uh, in marketing, you know, what else do you do when you have a degree in political science? You, know, you work in market. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> like everybody else. Uh, and so I leave that and I go and I study like these crazy things that my parents and nobody understood what I was doing. I was, I went to study ancient comparative ancient civilizations. And then I did a master's in anthropology and another master's in at Harvard in, in comparative religion. And kind of getting to to, to the point of it was what I was doing, only in retrospect, I realized I was mapping thousands of years of human experience. Because when you look and you study ancient civilizations and mythologies and wisdom traditions, you're really looking at, you know, thousands of years of human experience and you start seeing patterns. 
And what I found, which connects to your point on the initiation, is I found the, these patterns that tell the story of how human beings over the course of millennia have come into their own potential, how the human right. spirit evolves in a way. And that I kind of took back and codified and merged and married that wisdom with cutting edge science in the realm of peak performance, habit formation, mindset, emotional intelligence to create the academy that I now have, Devon Academy, but also this philosophy of the initiation. That's awesome. And I'm excited to get into your academy uh, toward the, the end of this. I, I had a question and I wrote this down because I personally wanted to know the answer to this. From all of your experience in studying potential and purpose, is there is there a difference between passion and purpose? Are they similar but different? Like, I, I just I was curious to ask you that question. It's a great question. It's a great question, and and they are connected. The way to look at it is passion is kind of what makes you light up. Yep. And your purpose is what makes you light up the world. Oh, and, yeah. I like that. I'm going to have to write that down. I really like that. And the reason I ask, and, and this is the curiosity in me is, you know, the older I get, obviously, as you get older, you start to, I mean, it's just natural, right? You start to lose people closer to you mm -hmm. to different things. You go through some experiences. You know, I didn't have an experience like you um, when I was 20 or 19, 20 mm -hmm. years old. And so, you know, there's a lot of listeners that for whatever reason, they haven't had that life altering experience that calls them to really question their life. And, mm -hmm. and so I'm just really curious, you know, when you teach people, you speak on stages and you talk to people that maybe they haven't found their purpose. Maybe they've spent their whole life doing something to make money, doing something that maybe they just are naturally good at doing something that they just kind of enjoy, like, and they don't know what their purpose is. Like, how do you guide them to that? Or how do you like, what do you say to them that makes them have a little clarity there, if you don't mind? Of course. Um, you know, purpose is always the thing about purpose. It's always about other people. It's not about you. It's about supporting something bigger than yourself. And there's ways, even if you're not in your dream job, there's ways to bring purpose to your job and elevate the meaning of your work. Right. And what I always say to young people that I'm working with or anyone for that matter, I mean, everybody wants to be significant, which means I want, you want to have money and status and maybe fame at the corner office, whatever it is, all the time right. where no one's working in the office. <clears throat> so, you know, everybody wants to be uh, significant. And yet the only way to really become significant is through service because the more you serve other people the more significant you become to them the more value you have you you add to other people the more valuable you become right and purpose is whatever you're doing i think purpose is about and even if again you're not in your dream job as long as you can uh, bring, I think it's, it's connected to your signature strengths. So it's about finding and identifying what are your strengths? What are those areas where you can add value to other people mm. and then finding a ways within your job, your current job to bring that value to other people? Because when you do that, you will be serving. And when you serve, you will be significant. And that's where purpose is. I, I love that. And I just wanted to get clarity because, you know, I'm a business owner. I have a lot of friends and they own different companies and, you know, a lot of them make really good money. They're, they're well off. They're financially mm, set. Mm. Now they're looking for more than meaning. Like what's the purpose. And mm. I see a lot of them flail, right? They're like, well, I'll just volunteer. I'll feed the homeless. Mm. I'll donate to this cause, but that's, it's not bringing out like their real potential. Like it's just yeah. what they feel they should do. And maybe it'll lead them closer to like that gratifying feeling and they're not there mm. yet. So they're searching for it. And so I just, mm. I really wanted to get that clarity and you, you answered it. I mean, it's just like mm. connected to what you're great at. Cause I also have a really great friend here. He owns a, a car dealership successful, mm. but man, I didn't know until I hung out with him that he was addicted to drugs his whole life, mm. went sober. And he's this huge deal in the world of addiction. He speaks to tens of thousands of people and he's the happiest, most fulfilled person. And I'm mm. just like, man, I want 
Mm. I want that. And I just didn't mm. know if there was a process. Um, and actually, I want to get into that because you you teach a lot of that, you know, like just how people can change and things like that. Mm. And I wanted to kind of veer over there, but I didn't know if there's anything else that you wanted to share just on the topic of purpose. You know, I think COVID and the last year now for me as well as for anybody else, I think it's it's demonstrated. I think the world was working, was moving so fast and we've all become so disconnected. We had the illusion of connectedness That's through right. online and through social media, but it's not real connection. And it's like God, the universe was saying, all right, you want to see how much you really need each other? I'm going to show you, I'm going to really make you disconnected and yep. you're going to see how much you need that connection. And I think what COVID has shown us is how much we all need human connection and purpose again is tied to human connection. It's like the more we can connect to other people's energy, the more energy we receive and get in our own lives. And we that's feel, right. um, and that's what it's about. I think it's, it's, you know, the simplest way to put it is I think we all are here to serve something greater than ourselves. And the more we can tap into other people's lives and become significant and add value to them, we will feel and become valuable as well. And, and our mm-hmm. sense of meaning and purpose will grow. So it's really that simple, I think. Um, and so, <laughs> Don't and about deep, it. yeah, and it's about deeper relationships. I think that's, you know, we all have now so many connections on LinkedIn and and, and this WhatsApp and this and that, but it, it's about the deeper connections where you can call someone at two o'clock in the morning or when you really want to vent, someone that really knows you, that really gets you, where you don't have to put on the, the you know, the mask and, um, I think that's what we're all looking for. And people that really have those genuine deep relationships are the most satisfied. The science shows that as well. I love that. I mean, I I really, and we're going to pivot, but I just, I could talk about this all day Mm. just because Mm. I, you know, in doing a podcast, I, I just watch, I I love to people watch. I love Mm. to study. And there's just, I see a lot Mm. of people and myself included, Mm. you know, we start families and then we become more disconnected with everybody outside Mm. of that. Right. Mm -hmm. And then we crave it. I want the deep relationships people do, but it's just like, you know, how do you balance that? So, Mm. but I want to pivot off because Mm. there's the next thing I wanted to talk about is something that I know is going to help people that's listening today. And that's change. Mm. It's one of the hardest things in the world for people to do Um, like real lasting change, Mm. right? Like, Mm. you know, anybody can change on January 1st for a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, you know, like I was saying earlier is most people, they only get to that point after some like life changing experience that like fundamentally shifts their belief system, mm-hmm. like a health issue or losing somebody mm-hmm. that they love. Um, but is there a way to get to like that drastic change, but with a process rather than having to face something like you did to get there? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. You don't need the transformational moments. True. Truly, truly, truly. Um even when you have, the, see what's happening when you have the transformational moments is you find some deep motivator that makes you basically put out massive action and take com- committed, consistent action to doing something. Yep. And that's what change requires is, is ultimately rewiring your brain by through doing a lot of consistent action in, in a certain direct, in a certain way. So the other way to do it is simply through you know, as cliche as it sounds, is through habits. I mean, I always say, if you want to change your life, you've got to change your days. That's right. If you want to change the outputs and, and the outcomes you're getting, you got to change the inputs you're giving yourself. And that mm. starts and ends with habits. And it starts and ends with, you know, we really become who we are. And so, you know, you know, we, our brain just always is always looking to conserve energy. It's always looking to make things automate, automate behavior. So yep. habits are really hard to break. And uh, one of the things that we teach and one of the system we developed is with Devon Academy is, you know, motivation comes and goes, even for the best of us are so disciplined. So we need to have accountability. We need to do it in groups and teams with others. And I think one of the things that we help others when it comes to, to help, when we help people change it requires that group support, that accountability, because it's really difficult to change habits on your own. Uh, gotcha. So with that, uh, I want to, 
you mentioned, you know, Devon Academy. Can you explain mm-hmm. a little bit? Cause you're, you're the founder of that. And, you know, it's funny. You shared a little bit about your story and what led to you going on a search, but you know, and I'll put this in the intro for you, but man, you have a badass story. You've done some really cool stuff in your life. I mean, you, <laughs> Deepak Chopra praised like what you do and what you teach, which is like, that's insane to me. My wife loves him, you know, for, she used to work for Oprah mm. oh, and wow. Oprah's obsessed wow. with them. And so yeah. that's like, that's awesome. But like, what is Devon Academy? Like what's its purpose and, and what do you do there and who do you serve? Um, well, Devon Academy is really about answering a big, a huge problem that is emerging today. And that is that, and I'll put on kind of my anthropological hat, that there used to be rites of passage that prepared a young person for the world they're entering. Mm. And technology has made rites of passage obsolete and redundant. There are no longer rites of passage. And so what's happening is, again, there's no mechanism that prepares a young person for entering the workforce in the world. Right. University sort of used to be that place, but degrees don't mean much anymore. They don't guarantee you a job. They don't really prepare you for the job. Certainly if it's a general degree, and because of technology, we're no longer going off to university on our own and have to figure stuff out and become adults on our own. We're kind of connected to our family and friends back home. That's right. We have a problem with, you know, roommates. We call our folks, you know, roommate issues. You know, we, we, we hang, lean on our friends back home, FaceTime, Zoom, social media. So we never really disconnect and are forced to figure stuff out. So I think there's this whole phenomena today of kind of what's called emerging adulthood, where the whole, yeah. we think about it, our generation, say, you know, um, Gen X, right? We're both, I'm assuming Gen X kind of just, be, and just be, you know, on the cusp of Gen X millennials. Um, you know, previous generations getting a job, you know, you, you got a, you landed a job, you kind of found your career path, you bought a home, uh, got married, it all happened, you know, late 20s, early 30s, let's say. Yep. Today, all that's being pushed 10, 15 years down the line, where that's exactly right. all the basic indicators of sort of becoming an adult are really pushed farther down the line. <clears throat> and so Devon Academy is here to answer a problem, which is the skills that employers are looking for, and which all of us need to s- succeed and thrive, are not taught in schools. And they're being eroded, eroded by technology. And they are the comp- they're the skills that companies want to need the most. Soft skills, human skills, That's power right. skills. Uh, so we come in and we teach people all those essential, we call it like almost human superpowers, your mindset, your emotional intelligence, yep. uh, your stress management skills. This is what's going to set you apart. This is what's going to make you successful. This is what's going to make you thrive and, and rise up the career ladder. Uh, but nobody's teaching you this stuff. No one's initiated you. Nothing's life hasn't initiated you because you can hide behind screens and because That's you right. like think about Google. You know, if you ask anybody or even us, you know, you want to figure something out, you kind of Google it. So that you, we're losing the capacity. Like what happened to contemplation? The kind of That's like going exactly right. within to think about okay, how do I solve this problem instead of Googling it, right? Uh, contemplation, imagination. Like I have a daughter, seven years old. It's hard for her. She doesn't know how to be bored. (laughs) And boredom and knowing how to kind of occupy yourself, that is essential because you develop your creativity, your imagination, your intuition. All of these really basic human skills and superpowers are being, are not being exercised by the next gen who are growing up and conditioned by technology. You know, where texting today is is like talking, but it's not, you know, researchers saw that when you, if you're having a bad day and you, and you text somebody, it's like, you didn't talk to anybody. That's <laughs> If you actually meet them in person, your whole brain chemistry and biochemistry changes. Uh, so we, we, we're not exercising skills that we need to, to thrive. And Devon Academy is coming in and teaching those essential skills. Wow. Now, do you, does your Academy focus on just that small window of age group, or is it for anybody? Is it just to, to bridge that gap between school and workforce, or is there a more broad range of people that you work with? Well, these skills are for anybody, absolutely. Okay. So we do end up working with people of all ages, but we we believe that our, our focus is still 
you know, when it comes to companies, it's that entry level that we call it a zero to five bracket. So people that are just starting off in their careers, because I think as a young person, you have those additional challenges of like, who am I? Where yeah. am I going? What's my purpose? Although these questions can come up later, of course, but I think they're most potent when you're graduating college or high school and you really haven't experienced the world and you're looking to figure stuff out. That's where I think a young person can use that roadmap. So we really focus on those ages, but we're open to everybody. Yeah, I, I love that. And this, I mean, we're talking a huge problem that mm. I believe needs to be. So I have three daughters myself mm. and I watch this like everything you said is is actually happening and it's unfolding. And I'm just like, you know, the adversity that I faced growing up being super poor, having to figure it out, playing outside all day mm-hmm. when they, you know, mm-hmm. and I'm just like, how can I create that situation for them where they yeah. just don't want to be on a tablet or a phone all day? And, you know, I think about these things and then to take it one step further, you know, education to me is just like in need of the biggest disruption in the world, just to bridge that gap. You know, Mm -hmm. I I own a preschool and it just bothers me because we, you know, we have 33 teachers and when I get an application in, I don't even look at their education. I just Mm. look at the experience. Like, have you Mm. been in a classroom? Mm. Do you know how to manage kids if they were wild? And and it's just so sad because these people, they spend, some of them have probably spent hundred thousand dollars on an early childhood education degree. Mm. Mm. And I, like most employers, don't even look at that. We don't even, it's just like, you know, what's your experience and to have a company Mm. like yours that helps them bridge that gap, because that's the thing that I pay attention to when I'm interviewing is just like, Mm. are they resourceful? You know, are Mm. they able to have awareness? Are they able? So it's just like, wow, man, like what a great idea, first of all. Uh, So yeah, they, Thank you for creating that company. A lot of people need it. And I just can't imagine it not growing and scaling to something magnificent. Um, I uh, had a, a guest on the podcast probably a year ago that created Acton Academy, uh-huh. which is a preschool that teaches uh, not a curriculum, but teaches kids to think and to uh-huh. and it, man, it's a lot of entrepreneurs, CEOs send their kids there. She went from one little school in Texas uh-huh. to like 150 locations oh, and wow. Uh, but very similar philosophy as you is fantastic. Um, so the last thing that I wanted to share, and I tell you, man, if I could go back, I probably hmm. would want to have focused this interview on Gen Z. Maybe we can have another sure. interview at some point and, and focus on that. Cause I think it's important, but just operating at peak potential, you know, I, I think a lot of people, they 95% of their decisions are subconscious. So they don't, they're not operating at any kind of potential. They're not challenged all day. Yes. I just would love to just have you share a little bit about the, the thresholds and how to get there, how to bridge that gap between where you are and operating at your highest level. Um, I'd love to pick your brain on that. Okay. I love it. I love it. Love it. It's, well, it's simple, but not easy uh, <laughs> as with everything. You know, <clears throat> everything in the world is created first in the human mind. That's right. This pen microphone, everything around us is first created in somebody's head. They design it, they think about it, yep. and then it's, it's manifest, it's created. And that is the case with everything in life. The problem is that most people are behaving or acting and being convi- or, or living from their past, not their mm. potential, where our brain is on the loop and we're conditioned. And again, it, a lot of this is subconscious stuff from the zero to seven age, you know, when, you, when you really don't have a... An, uh, an operating system. Your brain doesn't have an operating system. So it downloads the operating system of your parents, your family, your community, friends, and that becomes your lens through which you see the world. And I think we spend the rest of our lives trying to, in the best case, break through those imposed lenses that you've downloaded to create your own mm. and to expand your horizon of what's possible. And really the only way to do that is I think where you where you find your tension in life is where you find your potential. The only way to grow is 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 to you know cliche cliche step out of your comfort zone. You know you got to go beyond what you know, and that's the whole part. In the initiation philosophy, basically says um, if you want to create something new in the world and ultimately in yourself, you've got to separate from people, places, powers, and ideas that define you because everything that defines you also confines you. 
Oof, and if you want to, right, you want to think outside the box, you've got to leave the box. You are, we are all so much bigger and greater and vaster than any box, anybody else, let alone we ourselves put upon ourselves. Hmm. <clears throat> and to leave that box, we have to push against tension, which is going, <clears throat> excuse me, going into our, or away from our comfort zone. And it takes me back to things I've studied, like, you know, the very story of, you know, getting biblical for a second, right? The story yeah. of Abraham. And God says to Abraham, go forth, leave your birthplace, leave your family, leave your father's home, and go to this new land you've never been to, because that is where your promise lies. That's leave right. behind everything that defines you, your culture, your homeland, your parents, your family. And that's where your promise lies. And that's indeed where you transform from Abram to Abraham, the father of many nations. And you see that same story repeating itself in every religion, let alone in, in, in the Bible. And it's the story of leaving behind the known <clears throat> and sort of going into yeah. the unknown, into the tension, because in t all tension is really potential, potential energy that has manifested. And the, the 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 human brain, because of our fear, of, you know, fight or flight mode, we when we feel tension, we want to run away. That's right. But what we really need to do is step into it, and that's what most people don't do, <laughs> because we want to, you know, we want to grow, but we want to be comfortable. Can't can't happen together. I love that. And, you know, to piggyback on something you said, because a couple times in this interview you've mentioned, well, you know, it's it's cliche, but mm -hmm. it's the truth and. You know, years ago, Chris Widener, he's an author, and he was giving a keynote on a stage, and he said mm. something that really hit me. He said, you know, most people don't need to be taught. They just need to be reminded. You know, it's like mm. most people know what to do. They know how to change. They know how to be healthy. They know how to be yes. successful. But mm. it's just they – it's the cliche, right? Like they just mm. need to be reminded mm. instead of some – because people think there's some crazy secret, but really it's the simple things that are in the books that were written thousands of years ago mm -hmm. that already mm -hmm. teach you, you know, the greatest, the richest man in Babylon, the richest man who, yes. I mean, these books, there's nothing new. Like mm. it's just it's so, new. That's, and it's a nature show. Like, you know, <laughs> look at nature. So for example, you take a seed, Yeah, a seed can't manifest its creative potential without separating from its source. The seed must fall from the tree and not only fall from the tree, it must be buried in the darkness and depths of the earth, symbolic burial death for it to then be resurrected and then grow and sprout into its own potential. And it needs to be far enough removed from the source, from its parent tree to have enough sunlight and water to grow into its full potential. Separation mm. leads to creation. That's one of the fundamental things in this initiation philosophy is we just, separation leads to creation. Dude, um, you've said like five things in this interview that I've got to go back <laughs> and I'm going to write this down. It's so awesome. good. Like define you confide. Oh, I just like, I really, really love the way, not only just like the, but like the way that you word it, like, it's just, it's great. So, um, speaking of the initiation, as we, as mm. we wrap up, um, where can people find this? Like, I mean, for all everybody listening, like I, I'm telling you, everybody is going to get something valuable out of this interview. And for those that want more and not just the surface mm -hmm. of what we talked about, like where can they follow your content? Where they, can they learn mm -hmm. more? Where can they discover? Like, where do you host everything that you're putting out into the world? Well, I thank you for that. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm working. I've been working for the last 10 years on this book, the initiation and, and I'm, I'm hopeful in the next year it's going to come out. I'm actually you know, going to spend some time with some editors and just <clears throat> bringing it to its final form. But I'm excited to get the book out and I'll, I'll be glad to sort of come back on or share with you when it's kind of uh, coming on the way out. So there's that. Uh, there's our awesome. podcast as well, the, the, the Und Undisruptable, which is, you know, has some of this content there as well, but not all of it. Um, to be honest, I got to be more active on social media. I think, uh, there's some stuff on social, but I, I need to put more stuff <clears throat> on social. Um, but the book, I would say to people, awesome. uh, the book will be coming and I'll look forward to kind of sharing more when it does. 
That's awesome. Yeah, I'll put your website um, on, on the show notes. And man, I can agree. You know, it's so funny. I have a, a biz, an old business coach of mine here. Mm. And he sold his company for, you know, a, a billion dollars. And I think he walked away with over 200 million. And, and mm. it's just like, I met him through a dinner and he has this like $20 million wine. So, I mean, it's just over the top, but mm. you know, he's such a cool guy. He's in his sixties, made his money in healthcare and he loves coaching people. He coaches mm. lots of entrepreneurs, mm. but he's like the same thing. He's just like, I hate. I, he's like, I fucking hate social media. He's like, yeah. I don't want to make posts. I don't care. He's like, I love teaching. I love get, but it's just, mm. it's so funny. Cause we were talking and he was just like, you know, if you know anybody that is like looking for business coaching and I was like, Man, how is somebody like you yeah. not have like 7,000 people beating down your door? And it's just because he's not building a brand in social media because he doesn't want to. And it's yeah, just like, I'm kind of the same, like, you know, I, I prefer focusing on the work <laughs> and you know what, if people, people are going to resonate, they're going to find me and they do. Um, That's right. I just don't. Yeah. I'd rather not spend time curating and, and not to this respect, <laughs> people that do, I think it is important. You know, people build brands, but I just, it's not in my personality. Maybe one day there'll That's, be someone that can help me do that, but That's a, Yeah. That's exactly right. You know, I, it, it's funny. Have you ever heard of uh, David Coggins who wrote the book? Can't hurt or yeah. Can't hurt me. I think is the name of it. Okay. Rings a bell. Yeah. I mean, we could talk about it after the mm. recording, but um, yeah, it's, 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 he hates social media really mm. like, like crazy. Uh, but he wrote a book and he used a company to ghostwrite the book and mm. it like became a number one New York times bestseller. It was wow. just like, it was huge. And I interviewed the mm. CEO of that company on this podcast. It was a really cool story, but uh, man, I'm excited for your book. I can't wait mm. for it to come out when it does. Got to let me know because I think everything we talked about today is, is something people need to think about. I mean, it's, it's a big problem. Education more than anything. And the mm. soft skills that you're ta- you're mm. talking about, it's, they're teaching them less and less mm. and they're needed more and mm. more. And I'm glad there's companies like yours out there that bridge that gap. So it's, it's really awesome, man. Thank you so oh, much for your you. time today. Is there, is there any, anything else you want to leave the listeners with before we wrap up? Hmm. Well, first, you know, thank you for, for this opportunity. This has really been a fun, I just love your thank energy you. and, and your, uh, yeah. Looking forward to learning more because seems like we have a ton in common. We I do. Know, a school, yep. a preschool. Um, so what would I, you know, one final thought. I think the final thought is, I think people, we all have, and I think because of social media, these expectations that life is supposed to be easy and that life is supposed to be beautiful. And life is beautiful, but life is also hard. And I think we need to learn how to hold those two perspectives in unison. And, and there's this beautiful quote by Joseph Campbell. I'm gonna, I won't do justice to it, but I'll try to bring it up. And he says, you know, it, it ends with, you know, um, how does it end? Um, the sorrowful joy and the jo- joyful sorrow of the knowledge of life as it is. We cannot cure the world of sorrows, but we can choose to live in, with joy. Mm. life is always going to be there's always going to be struggles even if you have money you you know there's other things if you don't have money or you don't have the right job there's always something and we're always striving for that next thing and i think it's when we can just lower our expect not lower the expectations but we still have high expectations and, and goals and dreams yes but understand that life is both sorrowful and joyful. And we can always make a choice, even when things are not beautiful, to make the choice and appreciate the good things. And always you know, be grateful and have appreciation. Wherever you are, no matter how far you are along on your trajectory in terms of fulfilling your own potential, you can always just stop for a moment, recognize what you have, be grateful, and just hold those two perspectives in, 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 in unison. That's beautiful. I love that. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for taking time out of your day to share some of your perspectives with the audience. Um, I can't wait to publish this interview and promote it. Um, And I hope that we can do this again and we can talk about a whole other generation of people that that need this. But thank you. Thank you for being on today. Appreciate your time. Uh, Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, John.